Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sister. How are you? Wa alaikum as um, I'm good, alhamdulillah. How are you? Alhamdulillah, sister. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for joining us today on the Naqabi Diaries. Sister, could you please introduce yourself for us and tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure, inshallah. Thank you for having me as well. Um, my name is Rukaya, but I'm more well known on social media as Bint Barbados. Um, I'm com currently living in London, but I was born and raised in Barbados. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. And I studied um, the Alimiya course, Islamic Jurisprudence and Theology, for around eight years. And I graduated in 2017. Um, since then, I've been teaching um, Alimiya as well as um, Tajweed, uh, Arabic, all those kind of things. And um, I also have a baking business on the side so where i sell cakes and all the sweet stuff and do event planning as well and what sorry um what? event planning so okay. like planning. parties yeah. decor mm -hmm. yeah. and um in barbados so um we do a lot of stuff for reverts and um, the youth so like muslim teenagers because there's not much catered towards the reverts in my family we host like um, weekly halakas um, i also teach reverts in the evenings and we organize um, different events for them and the youth as well wow. and i also help there's a um, barbados association of muslim ladies where they do stuff for the muslim youth and um i help them um, in terms of like the islamic side of the events the talks the lectures and such i i help to do all of that with them mashallah mashallah that sounds amazing so inshallah we'll get more into that later on in the interview inshallah. um so sister could you um because your name on social media is bint barbados so could you kind of elaborate there like you know where where the, where does this name come from and what made you choose this name so um my ethnically i'm originally indian but my great great grandparents migrated to um, Barbados in the early 1900s. Okay. So it's quite like four or five generations of um, that of my family's being in Barbados. Um, and they were there actually, my great grandparents were the first, uh, amongst the first Muslims to move to Barbados. So first they came, they, my great granddad he originally went from india to brazil to as a trader mm -hmm. and while they were working in brazil they heard that there was um work in trinidad and they decided to move to trinidad but um when they were on their way to trinidad the boat didn't um it got went off track and ended up in, on the shores of barbados and when they got off they saw that there were um three bengali muslims um living there they had um chickens tied to their beds and in that time that was a sign of wealth like if you had chickens oh. that means you were wealthy and doing really well okay. so they were like oh the the um trade over here must be really good so they decided to settle there and then the bengalis went back to bangladesh in a few years so then my great granddad and the and a few guys he was with they settled there, then they called their wives, then um, started building masajid, and um, then they had kids, and then the Muslim community started growing. But alhamdulillah, with them, they helped the Bajan community quite a lot in terms of funding their education. Even our previous um, minister, prime minister, was um, his education was funded by one of the Muslims in the early 1900s. Mashallah. So they... They helped the local community quite a bit when they settled. So up to now, the um, community is very accepting of Muslims and the Indians and stuff over there because of the amount our forefathers did for them. So they okay. accept us quite good. Mashallah, that's amazing. So which, of which part of Barbados? Because uh, I have, uh, as I have um, Bayesian um, history and um, heritage as well. So which part of Barbados um, what did they did they land? 
So they settled in the main part in the city in the bridge town. Okay. And that's where the majority of the Muslims live currently in the city. And then we've had um, recently more people have been moving out into the, the suburbs and the rural areas. But majority of the Muslims are centered around central the um, bridge town. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> All right, sister, alhamdulillah, that's really interesting. I love um, learning about historical um, things. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to how you started to wear the niqab. What made you want to wear it? Um, so in my family, uh, alhamdulillah, my mum wears niqab as well as my all my dad's sisters mm -hmm. and um, his cousins. Uh, the, a lot of the women in my family wear the niqab. Um, but what really inspired me to wear it is when I was going to secondary school, um, the headmaster's uh, wife, she wore niqab and she was very um, involved in like community projects and a lot of doing, a lot of that work and doing stuff for um, people around her. And I really admired her and her um, personality and the way she did stuff. And I always said that I want to aspire to be like her mm -hmm. and she used to wear the niqab as well and she was very um, quite strict on it and I always looked up to her as a role model so from the time I was like in secondary school um, 13 14 I always said I wanted to wear niqab mm -hmm. but I did I wanted to wear it from then because a few of my classmates started wearing it from then mm -hmm. but um, my parents advised me to wait till I finished school to then uh, and then make a proper decision in wearing it instead of putting it on and then taking it off later they said it's best to think through it and then take that step when i'm sure that i'm ready to um wear it instead of wearing it then taking it off and not doing it properly yeah so alhamdulillah um i thought about it in all those years and then i started studying alimiya um and when i was in my fourth year I decided now I wanted to take that step of actually wearing it and commit to it. So Alhamdulillah, it's been six years now since I've been wearing the niqab. Mashallah, mashallah. So I take it, how, did you find it easy then to wear it since you've taken such a long time to decide and you've had wanted to wear it for quite a while? Was it an easy thing for you? Um, at the beginning, it was quite easy. To transition into it as well because i have already been um wearing abaya and hijab mm -hmm. and dressing modestly etc so it was quite an easy um transition and everyone around me um wore it and the environment was quite accepting of it it was quite nor normal so it wasn't like a huge um difference or something foreign to what i knew mm -hmm. but i found that as the years went on it became more and more difficult Especially now in the recent times, like um, with how um, at, on social media, it's quite common to not wear niqab and to display your beauty mm. and stuff like that. And I think I also um, glowed up after I started wearing niqab. So that like had, had became a quite a bit of a fitner for me in terms of like I'm always battling whether to keep wearing it or to um, fall into my desires of like mm -hmm. showing myself off. So I kind of also stay away from even posting pictures in niqab on social media because yeah. I feel like that would cause me to fall, like slowly fall into taking it off. Mm. Um, yeah, but I think it's become more and more of a struggle, but it also helps keeping me grounded, I find, with wearing niqab. Alhamdulillah. So I want to ask as well, like from the aspect of like obviously being living in Barbados and starting yeah. to wear the niqab in Barbados itself. You said you was you, you know your environment that you was in. There's a lot of Muslims and a lot of them were wearing the niqab. But like, what about the non-Muslims? How is how is the niqab seen in Barbados? Um. So in the Bajan community, it's quite accepted. As I mentioned earlier, they quite um. It's accepting of our Islam and us openly practicing it. I find it, it's, um, since I've been living in London, I find it more easy um, to practice Islam in Barbados than over here in London. Really? In, in terms of like um, the public, the way they accept you, um, they're, they're very, very friendly towards you and there's not much um, friction and they don't, um, they don't act like you're doing something foreign. Um, but over there, what happens is like we in my family, we do a lot of water sports and um, activities at 
safety and stuff. And we all do it while fully covered and modestly. Yeah. Um, and we also, it's a tourist island destination. So we yeah. have a lot of tourists. Mm -hmm. So when we're at the beach and stuff, you'd get, um, you'd get like, instead of the locals um, giving you dirty stairs and looks, it will be the tourists. But then they'd hear your Bajan, your local accent, and then they'll be like, oh, so you're actually from here. And then they'll shut up. But like a few times that like, tourists will see us in the car, like me, my mom, my aunt, and they'd be, they'd give us really dirty looks or drop comments about us wearing the car, like at the beach or in the sea, mm -hmm. on the boat, jet skis, whatever. And then they'd, they'd hear my, my dad speaks really strong Bajan. So they'd hear our local accent and realize we're actually from the island and they're not. So then they'd shut up. And then the Bajans will also back us in terms of those things as well. If someone like attacks us on our religion, our appearance, they, all the locals will like back us in that. Mm. So it's quite um, good, oh, alhamdulillah. Mashallah, that sounds amazing. I, cause to be honest, like, because I'm a revert, so I've only been to Barbados as a non Muslim. So oh, okay. I'm wondering, like, you know, when the Nakab, like, black, how would it be seen in Barbados and like this kind of thing? And I suppose still, if I do go back there eventually, it might be a bit different for me because obviously I've got non-Muslim family. So, but yeah. alhamdulillah, I think so far, like those those who know, I mean, my family were close, alhamdulillah. But you know, it's just like those kind yeah. of differences culturally. It's, it's interesting, you yeah. know, because I don't know much about the you know the history of Islam in Barbados. I didn't know that it yeah. went back so far, actually. To be honest, mashallah. It's yeah. Really it's really quite in, 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 um, like you know lots of people don't expect like even when tourists come to Barbados like our house is quite near to the seaport mm -hmm. where the uh, cruises dock so we get loads of tourists every um uh, passing through our house and our street and stuff like that and when they see our the masjid of opposite our house is quite huge it's the biggest masjid yeah. in Barbados and when they see it and they see the huge Muslim community they're always shocked at like wow we didn't expect such a large Muslim community in like a uh, paradise island mm. and we're like yeah there's quite a, a dominant uh, Muslim minority but alhamdulillah mashallah mashallah that's amazing Wow. So have you, so basically like what about traveling with the niqab and everything? You've obviously traveled from Barbados to London. Have you been to any other places and what's that experience been like for you? Um, since I've been wearing niqab, traveling, I've only been to the UK, so England and Scotland. But I've traveled quite a bit over here in because um, I got out quite a bit and explore quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't find there's, I find traveling easy, alhamdulillah, with the niqab. You do get people that um, sometimes causes, like try to cause um, difficulties for you. But in terms of like authorities and getting through like um, the airport security, it's quite easy, alhamdulillah. Okay. Um, but sometimes like on the planes or on the public transport, you get people giving you dirty looks like why are you wearing that and they try to make life difficult for you mm. but i'd say that's a very 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 small percentage compared to like majority of people Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. so would you say in your experience um in the muslim community in barbados and even the muslim community here or, or the non-muslim community as well do you feel that sisters who wear the niqab get treated differently um from the sisters who wear hijab the scarf um i think there is a bit of difference um in in wearing the niqab as in you're more on display and more you stand out more mm -hmm. so people's attention are more what you're doing how you're conducting yourself if you make a slip up um it's more recognizable notice Mm -hmm. than someone who doesn't wear uh, nik uh, the niqab or even hijab um so you have to be quite conscious all the time of what you're, you're doing how you're carrying yourself mm -hmm. um your manners etc but i'd say in the muslim community i find with wearing niqab um sometimes it's your own muslim community that makes it more difficult for you yeah uh found in my experience like not in my immediate circles but sometimes the outer muslim community they'd see that you've taken that step to reach um maybe like another level that you've decided to actually wear the niqab cover your face 
and they feel threatened by it so then they make life difficult for you and saying like why do you need to wear it it's not fur you should, you're just making life difficult for everyone else um you're not gonna be able to do this and that with the niqab mm. um and st- or stuff that really doesn't make sense and stop you like since i've started wearing niqab um alhamdulillah i've still been able to do everything i do like I'm, our family is quite active in sports and yeah. uh, as i mentioned what activities and all of that type of stuff we're quite outdoor people yeah. and that have never stopped any of us from like wearing a club has never stopped any of us from doing any of those activities and stuff like that so i think people just project um their insecurities onto you that because they may not be able to take that step they think that you should also not be able to take it yes yeah, subhanallah that's you know i it's similar to um i think for example um women in general going into business as well that's another yeah. thing like because I, I saw something by um the sister um who runs sisters in business and um she was yeah, saying yeah. she was saying in a post um yesterday all well, her monday post that she usually has that um basically like you know being a mother and stuff like that you always hear these things even before marriage people will tell you oh well you know you better do this now because when you're gonna get when you get married you won't be able to do this and when you get kids you won't be able to do this so people have these kind of built up perceptions in their minds that when they have different stages yeah. coming to their life that they won't be able to do certain things like traveling and have, running your own business and you know going places that maybe yeah. you wanted to go so i think it's similar to you know when people decide to wear the niqab like there's this perception that you're just going to be literally stuck at home you know you can't yeah like anything. you can't progress in different areas exactly. of your life yeah it's because it's, it's you're wearing like an that. Yeah, a lot of sisters, and even to be honest, it's even similar for some sisters. They think that way about the hijab itself as well, like just wearing the yeah. headscarf, for example. Some sisters have this, you know, kind of um, idea in their mind, and also similar to even when the ibaya or the jilbab. Some sisters feel that if they dress yeah. like you know, the more Islamic they look, basically, the less yeah. likely they can have like a normal or regular life or do those things that they've always kind of wanted yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah. subhanallah. And I find like with wearing niqab, the non-Muslims admire you and respect you more because they see that you are, um, you're doing it for the sake of Allah yeah. and you're so firm on it that you, um, they admire the amount of like loyalty you have to your religion mm. and how firm you are and they um, respect you for that choice of not, not conforming to their ways and giving up your beliefs and your faith for them. And then that also helps you progress in certain areas as well. Yeah, alhamdulillah, definitely I agree with that. I think, because I think I think it's you know it's like you said it's about respect. Because yeah. You might not understand something, but you know I think when people see that you do stand for something, they have a, a certain amount of yeah. respect for you, even if they maybe yeah. themselves yeah. don't personally agree with it. You know they still have a respect for you yeah. because of you know what it takes especially when the niqab in this like you know in the climate that we live in now it's not the norm you know and we're not doing it to be trendy or you know fashionable or anything like that so there is there is that definitely that element it does come into play sometimes with people so yeah, definitely. On, on that note would you say that the niqab is a barrier and if so in which sense um i wouldn't say it's a barrier at all it hasn't stopped me from anything alhamdulillah um i in on that note i think it actually keeps me more grounded because i feel like if i weren't wearing niqab um there's a lot of things i'd fall into but because i wear it i have that constant reminder that i'm visibly a muslim um, this is something, this is like a responsibility on me to carry out um, from Allah. So that always stops me if I want to fall into a certain sin, or I want to go to a certain place. I'd be constantly reminded, okay, I'm wearing my niqab and I need to represent it because I'm like a representative of Islam by being out by my outer appearance. Mm-hmm. And in those things, it keeps you grounded and keep um on the straight path and helps you to make the correct decisions and um stuff like that alhamdulillah alhamdulillah definitely i think i I totally agree with you with that as well alhamdulillah so have you ever met any sisters in barbados or in the uk who have wanted to wear the niqab but 
they're not allowed to wear it for some reason maybe their family members are preventing them or on the flip side have you met anybody who's been forced into wearing it um i have on both sides so over here i've met one sister um i've met a few sisters who really wanted to wear it but because of their circumstances um they're not allowed to mm. and one sister in particular her her um, family she really really wants to wear it. even like wearing a hijab her family is very against it they're mm -hmm. muslim but they're very cultural so they um tell her like why does she need to wear hijab um why why does she want to wear the niqab like it's it's fine you can um you don't have to and it makes it really difficult for her so sometimes she does wear the niqab like outside when she's away from her family and they wouldn't be seeing her mm. but like she'd take it off when she goes home and never let them know that she's actually wearing it oh, wow. and i think that's quite sad because um like as a Muslim family, you'd want to encourage the people in your family to dread modestly and to follow Islam correctly instead of putting them off. And I find that quite saddening. And also on the other side, um, not necessarily forced into, but um, when I was, as I said, when I was growing up, like a lot of the girls I knew, um, about three or four, um they peer, the parents considered the niqab to be fired so as soon as they uh, reach um puberty they had to wear it like okay. they weren't considered exactly forced but they knew that their parents would expect them to wear it as soon as they reach puberty mm -hmm. which i think in a way that i find that with some of them because they were at such a young age 10 11 12 yeah. they didn't because as a kid you kind of need to go through those phases of like getting certain stuff out of your system like yes. dressing up and stuff like that mm -hmm. and because they never had that exposure and just went straight into it from such a young age later on in their life like now they're kind of rebelling against it mm. because they haven't had that space to express themselves and stuff like that yes yeah, upon a lot <clears throat> so you mentioned that their sisters here and um, that you've met that they would like to wear but their environment um like prevents them from wearing it um like what what kind of advice would you give to sisters like that who their family kind of want to try to prevent them from wearing the niqab or they're in these kind of situations that, that they feel that the environment doesn't allow for them what kind of um, advice would you give them if they you know to help them to get to wear the niqab because I, I often get asked these questions on social media, actually, by sisters. Yeah. You know, they want to wear it and stuff like that. So what kind of advice would you personally give to a sister who would like to wear the niqab and thinking about um, it? I always tell them to keep making dua because with dua, it can open uh, doors, so many doors. Your family's heart can change just like that with the power of the dua. Um, and I say to always be gentle with your family because families... Um, would give you a they try sometimes to make it very difficult for you but by you constantly being kind to them and gentle with them educating them on on the correct way and then they see seeing your change behavior in terms of you when you start dressing modestly they see how you've become like more grounded maybe how your clerk has changed how you deal with them they would be like okay it's not a bad thing like it has changed her as a person and then they may start accepting it and slowly then um allow you like stop from putting you off of it mm. or like giving you um friction with with actually wearing it so i always say to first start with making dua for them and if it's your parents like you can't be harsh with them and and start like shoving rules down their throat about like okay you need to let me do this because that will just make them hate you more and and um give you even more trouble and difficulties so it's always good to be kind and gentle with everyone around you and let them see it through your character and your the way you um conduct with them and then slowly inshallah like, i find even one other sister i knew she what used to have a lot of friction from her family but because the way she changed after she started like praying and wearing hijab and stuff like that slowly they became accepting of it because they saw how she changed from before to when she started dressing modestly and that helps your family become more um accepting alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. 
So sister, could you like tell us more about your business, um, event planning and um, the cake, the, the baking business that you said you do? Yeah, definitely, inshallah. So um, I started baking from the time I was like 10, 11. I was always passionate about baking. My, my aunts, my dad's sisters were um, the very good bakers and my family were known for our bake stuff or desserts, stuff like that. So from the time I was very, very young, I started baking. Actually, the first time I baked was with my dad because I remember my mom, um, I wanted to bake so bad and my mom was so tired that day. And she was like, whatever you want to do, just go and do it, but you better clean up after. And then I was like to my dad that I don't know what to do. And then, so he was like, he was so clueless as well in the kitchen. And he came and then we were trying to read through the recipe and figure out what to do. And then he helped me and like even the pan sizes, we didn't get it. So he, we like the pan said nine by 13, but we didn't, we cannot find where my mom's pans were. So then he just make do with a pan and then put like a foil strip in it. And it was so funny, but we somehow made it. And then from then my mom was like, okay, you can start baking. And then every weekend I'd bake like different things. And then when I was like around 15, 16, everyone like by then um i've started baking quite a lot and improved quite a lot as well and everyone around me was like you should uh, definitely start it as a business like we'd want to buy from you instead of just like you gifting it to us every now and then so then i thought about it and um i started it as kind of like side thing for pocket money so for the first few years um i just did it like here and there whenever anyone would ask i'd just make it for them and then I'd give like, when we'd have like different events and stuff, I'd make it to like the bake sales and stuff like that. And then um, I moved to London to complete my studies. And then after I graduated, I decided to take it more seriously. And Alhamdulillah, after that life, I made, like, I started like um, advertising more and then I started getting more orders and then I improved quite a lot. Um, and in terms of the event planning, um, I first started doing like the parties and like uh, we'd have like host parties at our house and for different events and stuff like that. And everyone would always comment on how I decorated the stuff and how I hosted. And they were like, you should definitely start doing it as a business. So I started with my family and friends. And then Alhamdulillah, this only like last month, I've decided now to actually um offer it to more people because lots more people been asking for me to organize the events for them and decorate it for them so alhamdulillah inshallah i want to now start it officially um and put more effort into it sure. especially with my baking as well i want to now i've got a few more ideas of getting it on board i've recently started um postal orders where you can just order and then have it posted straight to your doorstep wow so, oh Allah, I'm so is, this, to... is this in the UK, yeah? Yeah, in the UK. So what kind of events do you actually host? Um, so I host all, all kinds, but it's mainly weddings like at home. You know how because of uh, COVID and lockdown, a lot of people yeah. had their nikahs at home. So it's mainly like home events for weddings, um, por like uh, different parties, um, like we may have with your friends and graduation um also like for aid um okay. decoration stuff like that any any kinds of, i'm looking to go maybe a bit bigger inshallah but we'll see keep me your duas i mean i'll make it easy for you i mean <laughs> that sounds amazing so can you tell us a little bit more about teaching of the reverts you said you help you teach revert sisters was you doing that in barbados as well or like what's the yeah of so yeah. Um, yeah. So in Barbados, I've been doing that. So what we in Barbados, there were no like over here in London. It's quite a diverse community. So you get things catering for all types of people, backgrounds, ages. Um, loads of there's so much options in, of classes and stuff for everyone to go to but in Barbados because the community Muslim community is mainly of Indian descent meaning we um, quite um, exposed to Islam from the time we we're born we don't really need like we are taught in our families everything we don't need that um, like there's not much catering to other people so uh, recently we've been getting quite a lot of actual local reverts alhamdulillah and um there isn't much 
there's quite a bit for the men Muslim revert, but there wasn't a lot for the Muslim um, female re reverts. So what um, my mom. So, so what do you mean in terms of lessons? Do you mean by in terms of lessons when you say there wasn't? Yes, much? in terms of lessons. So like they wouldn't have like classes for them to right. actually learn Islam from scratch, okay. um, learn how to pronounce the Arabic alphabet, how to read the Quran stuff like that so they'd mainly go to like people they know that were knowledgeable mm -hmm. and then be taught instead of actually having classes where it will be all of them together and because there were be, uh, in one year i think when i was there in 2019 last year there were quite a large amount of um muslim female reverts mm -hmm. um so then what i decided to do was do twice a week evening classes so where i'll have them come to my house and then I teach them like everything from the Sira to Quran to fiqh um, and then just general life lessons. Then also uh, with a lot of them, they because they come from um, non-Muslim backgrounds, they need a safe space to talk and like have advice and be helped in different areas as well. So I used to do quite a lot of that work with the help of my parents. Um, I'd help out quite a lot of them in different things in their life and a lot of them sometimes come from very poor backgrounds mm. so they need like different um things in help of like being getting financially stable help with their families um stuff like that so we my family helps a lot in those things in like raising money for them and then taking in them into our home feeding them stuff like that and then we were also so last year we started doing like events monthly events where we do um so we for the muslim youth but it was also catered for reverts as well because there wasn't anything to for the muslim teenage girls in terms for them like a space where they can go and be themselves in like um in a halal environment so we started like just before i came we do came to london before lockdown we did a fashion show so it was only uh, females and no recording um, no cameras allowed but it was and we did like different categories of like dress codes where all the youth and everyone who wanted to dress up and dress in different um, clothes in different categories were able to express themselves yeah so alhamdulillah i think you need to give people give people that space where they can be themselves but in a halal way instead of them having to seek validation from outside sources yeah, of course of course mashallah so do you think that is, is there actually a lot of um is it like a lot of people becoming muslim in barbados would you say like do you have quite a lot of reverts yes now we have quite a lot alhamdulillah in the last few years we've had we've seen quite um, an increase in reverts Alhamdulillah, more than when I was growing up uh, compared to now. Alhamdulillah. So um, the, you mentioned the British, uh, sorry, Barbados Association of Muslim Ladies. Yeah. So is that part of um, what you've just described, the different events yes, and yes. things? Okay. Yeah, so they, they're the main organization and then they, um, so it's a group of um, us on the panel. Mm -hmm. And then I'd overlook from the Islamic perspective. So like when they're doing events or planning out the year of different things to host, they'll like um, come to me for like if the lectures or to deal with the Islamic side of the things and to guide them in terms of if they're doing the correct thing, um, etc. Mashallah. So is there a, do you have a website or anything like that for this? Yes, yeah, so for the Barbados Association of Muslim Ladies, they actually have Insta, they have all the social media, and they also have um, a website. So it's baml.org.bb, I think. Okay, inshallah, and, we'll put the links in the description. Yeah, because I think inshallah. that you know, maybe there could be some people or sisters who are interested. And, um, yeah, yeah, definitely, inshallah. And they also do like features of Muslimas every month of different uh, Bajan Muslimas that have accomplished different things. So it's, it's good to like read a true as well and stuff like that. Mashallah, sounds amazing. Mashallah, sister. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you became an Ali, Ali, Alimiya? um so um I, oh as i said my main role model was the headmaster's wife mm -hmm. she was also an alima so um when i was around 13 14 i decided i wanted to start studying 
um, Islam further. So I did join up, but because I was still quite young and at school um, studying with uh, GCSEs, A levels, stuff like that, I didn't do it um, full time. So I did it more part time. But then once I graduated from school, uh, I started um, doing it full time. So I did around three years in Barbados, three, four years in Barbados. And then um, for the final two years, it's not at the, in Barbados, the, there's no, back then, because now Alhamdulillah, in the last year or two, we've um, now opened up to completing the final years over there. But before, um, you'd have to go overseas to complete your final years, because there was no one to actually teach you your final years and to graduate. Okay. So, so uh, sorry, can I just ask that, like, so is that, was there an Islamic school actually in Barbados that you were studying? Yeah. Oh yeah, God. so what's it called? Yeah, so so in Barbados we have an actual Islamic academic school where it's primary, secondary, and third education, Al Fala school. Oh so they offer like um actual academic education and it's the only Muslim school in Barbados. That's also where I went. I was the also the first student of that school. So till yeah, now they use our class and our year as the like one to for everyone to so we started that was founded in 2000 when i started school from reception okay. at that school so that cool. that's the main muslim school in barbados and then there's a few like um islamic evening schools where they teach yeah. like maktab and uh, islamic studies um quran tajweed all of that and also alimiya so with my alimiya i did it with al fala because they offered that on the side in the evenings or early mornings and then there's also uh, the different masajid as well because we have three main mas uh, masjids and a few smaller ones so all of the main masajid they also have evening madrasas and maktabs right um yeah so it is quite there is quite a lot in terms of that in islam education but it's not a lot for adults and um people of different backgrounds i'd okay. say yeah okay mashallah all right so as i was saying then i came here to the uk to graduate because you had to go overseas and most people either came like for me i had a british passport because i'm dual citizenship because yeah. my mom's from here so um, I came to the UK to complete my studies and then Alhamdulillah I graduated in 2017. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, that's so interesting. It's a really insight insightful for me actually because I didn't have a clue about any of this. I remember being in Barbados when I was about 18 before I'd become Muslim and being oh, okay. at the beach and seeing some sisters in their cob, you know, but I never thought, oh, they must be from Barbados. Do you know what I mean? Now I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, they probably were, they probably were Bayesian, you know. So which year did you got, were you in Barbados? Uh, which year was it? I think it was probably 99 or 2000. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's quite a while ago. Yeah, that's I quite, it it's changed so much since then. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was 2000, literally. So, subhanAllah, yeah. Yeah, that's quite a while back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mashallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. You definitely need to visit again, though, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah. Mashallah, sister. It's been really great talking to you. So, to close the interview, I'll ask you the final question. What does the niqab mean to you? Um, for me, it's the way of life and something that helps me um, become closer to Allah and um, as I mentioned earlier it helps keeps me firm and grounded as and as it uh, always um, shows me that I'm a representative of Islam um, yeah Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah sister Jazakallah khair thank you so much for giving us your time thank you for um, you know, giving so much insightful information about living in the in living in the Caribbean, basically. Subhanallah. Like I really didn't know about any of these things, but um, it's been really informative for me as well. So Jazakallah yeah, Khair for having me as well. It was um quite a thing. I always wanted to talk about is Islam in Barbados because that's something I'm quite passionate about. Yeah. Having that, my forefathers were one of the first Muslims there. So Alhamdulillah was able to touch on that a bit today. Alhamdulillah also talk about niqab and the different struggles we face as niqabis. Alhamdulillah. 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 Inshallah, maybe in future we can do another talk just specifically about the history of Islam in Barbados would be nice as well. Actually. Definitely.
inshallah i look oh, forward to it Allah, sister. thank you so much um assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh